Good evening and welcome back ladies, gents and Pikachus to another episode of the analysis and breakdown of the Quran of the Muslims! Yes, we'll be breaking this thing down verse by verse once again into factual, logical statements in English so that you and I can understand who or what is Allah Akbar and what does he mean by the contents of this book but more importantly than that how does this affect our lives today as non-believers in the current world? So, before I start, as I always do, I'm going to tell you now, if you have any doubts as to my factual accuracy or the things I'm about to say, please first buy and read one of these, an Arabic Quran, which is the only perfectly preserved word of Allah, not written by men, not translated or affected by any other forces who may be biased. Nope. You have to do it from this one, otherwise it's not the word of Allah. And once you have done that yourself, you'll recognize Every single word I'm about to tell you now is 100% true of the words of Allah and what Islam means today. Because I'm doing it personally myself and I want you to know the truth of this book. So with that in mind, let's carry on where we left off. So if you've been watching, uh, you saw the last um, six episodes, we've been going through Al-Nisa, which is the book of women and children. So you might think in your head this has got something to do with the upbringing of the children and the care of the mothers. In fact, no it doesn't, it is a jihad training uh, schedule, a training plan for turning innocent young children into murderous racist warriors of the jihad. And that's where we got up to last time we read to the end of verse 94. So let's carry on with verse 95. <clears throat> Lesser are they, Muslims who stay here and refuse to find their way to jihad, unless badly injured or sickly when returning. You must all go again to perform the jihad using as fuel your wealth and your lives in the causes of Allah. End of verse. So we're straight back into the fray, out of the pan, into the fire. If we break that down, Allah is depicting here a two-class system. So even though earlier on he kind of claimed between the lines that everyone in Islam is equal, apart from men are above women, now he's saying in the men who go to do the jihad, there's two groups there as well. So it's like sub-socialism. Lesser are they, Muslims who stay here in the Muslim countries and refuse to find their way to the jihad. So that's what he's saying. Guys who go to do the jihad are better than the ones that don't. The ones that don't are worthless and they are basically infidels. Then he goes on. Unless badly injured or sickly when returning... You must all go again to perform the jihad using as fuel your wealth and your lives. So what he's saying there is, if you go to the jihad, which you should be doing, O oh Muslim children, because remember, this is the mother teaching the children in class what they're going to do when they grow up. If you return badly injured or sickly, then you can hang around until you've healed up and only that far. Then you have to go back out and return to the jihad and go again, using as fuel your wealth and your lives. So you don't even get given money for this. You have to spend your own money on the jihad and die by spending your life in the causes of Allah. And as we know, the causes of Allah are the holy jihad in service of the end times genocidal prophecy, murdering everyone on earth who doesn't surrender to Allah, who isn't Islamic and Arabic, and recouping the wealth from east and west to give back to Allah at his mosque. That's what this means. Then he goes on. It's quite a long verse, this, so we split it in two. Then he goes on. When you do, Allah favours you. Who did continue in the jihad and spend your life and wealth? They will gain them back in greater degree. Allah promises them goods and a greater wage. If and only if they perform the jihad and do not hesitate. End of verse. And that is the end of that verse. So we know if we add those pieces together, what Allah is saying here is go and do the jihad. If you don't, you're lesser. When you do it, Allah will favor you. And when you don't, Allah will not favor you and will not love you. And he will send other Muslims to harass and hate upon you. And in addition to that, when you did continue in the jihad, so you, came, you went to do the jihad, you got shot or injured or something happened to you, and you came back to recover. Then you went back out to continue the jihad and spend your life and your wealth you're going to gain them back in greater degree. Even though you have to die before you get the greater degree reward, Allah's promising you, even though all his other promises in the past have all come out to be false, there's not one promise he's made that has been true to anyone throughout the whole Quran. 
Trust me, bro, says Allah, I'll definitely reward you more if you spend all your money and die in the service of Allah and his lofty goal of murdering the entire rest of the world. If you do this, then you will get rewarded. Even though I said earlier I preordained everything, so there should be no if and then. It should just be you do it, and there's no thinking. Because if you, if you think about it, which you wouldn't be able to do if there was preordination of things, if and then indicates freedom of choice. So, should we ask him? Allah! Allah! Come over here, Allah! Allah! You know you keep using these if-then-else statements to indicate branching paths of choice? When you said you preordained everything, did you, mean you, did you actually mean you preordained everything to be a choice? You know, like the God of the Torah like Christ, you know, with free will, even though you said that free will wasn't a thing and that you wrote every man's path, did you actually mean you wrote every man's path towards Christ, who gives us free will to say no to him? Because that's kind of what I'm reading between the lines here, when you say um, if and then and that kind of thing. Having to tempt us with rewards in the hereafter kind of indicates that you didn't pre-plan everything. So you are the greatest deceiver, that is the only thing you've said that has been true. But you are not the greatest of schemers and the greatest of planners, like you also claimed. Because if you were, you wouldn't have to say if every other page, would you? No. I didn't think you'd have much to say. And I hasn't got anything to say back to that. Like many of the questions I have brought to him since I started really studying his book hard, he has no answer for me. But it's because I'm a dumb infidel and I know nothing. I'm deaf, blind and dumb. I have no wisdom. Isn't that right, Allah? Yeah, yeah, those evil Jews and Christians. It's because I'm an infidel. Anyway, so we carry on. He gets to the end of that verse and says, If only they perform jihad and not hesitate. So that's the only reason they're getting back in greater degree all the stuff they spend and their death uh, having meaning. is If they do that in the service of jihad, then when paradise is created, he's going to ladle them with gold and virgins and they will have more life than they had when they were actually alive. Trust me, bro, says Allah in the book. And then we move on. 96. He judges you by many degrees and his rewards are given in degrees as if his forgiveness and mercy. And Allah is the most merciful, the most forgiving. End of verse. So we're back to the old competitive thing about he can't just be merciful and forgiving like God or Christ is. No, he has to be the most forgiving and merciful, better than everybody else. And I think the reason he's doing that, he's well aware when he's sending his children off on these jihads, they're going to hear about other things, other religions and faiths, and they're going to hear about God. They're going to hear about Jesus. And when they're reading the book of Jesus and they're meeting Christians, they're going to think, these guys are actually cool. I don't really want to kill them. They're nice. They give me stuff. They're being forgiving. But then when they go back to read the Quran, they're going to be like, I want to kill these guys. So that's the reason Allah is going to so much um, effort to say he's the most forgiving and merciful because he's going to have to be forgiving these guys every damn day for having friendships with Christians and everybody else and for having, um, you know, like regret towards the fact that they are commanded to kill everyone. Because nobody wants to go on a jihad, really. I mean, who there wakes up in the morning and goes, I've got a free Sunday, I'm going to go on a jihad and die. No one does that. The only reason you'd ever do that is because Allah has threatened you with violence and said you'll die and you'll be grave tortured and you will get no virgins, which is what he says. So we know in verse 96, given in degrees as his forgiveness and mercy, his forgiveness sucks and his mercy isn't merciful, it means death. And that is the reason why, as he judges you, O Muslim child, because remember, this is the mum telling the child how to be jihadi, Allah is the most merciful and forgiving. So while you're off lamenting the fact that you got born in an Islam country and you have to do this stupid jihad, even though you just want to play video games, Allah will forgive you for wanting video games, for wanting to listen to music, which is not halal. So you're not allowed to do it. Allah will forgive you as long as you kill those Jews. That's what this means. So we move on, 97. Surely those who unjustly hesitate, his angels cause them to, to die. And they say, where was Allah then? You know, after they've died, where was Allah then? And his angels say, 
We were weakened by your deceitful ways. Then they say, Is Allah's earthly world not sufficient and wide enough to please your wants? And so they will find an evil torment in place of Allah's ever fire, wherein they will abide forever and will suffer greatly. End of verse. End of reading. <laughs> so, a short one today. We only did four verses. But the reason is, I want to recap on the real detail of this. Because remember, this is child development. This is going straight into the heads of these innocent children. And they're going to be coming out with questions and thoughts. And I feel like that's why this has been condensed down into shorter verses with less words in. But the selection of the words is extremely devious. And that's what we're going to look at now. So, if we go back to 95, the first verse that we read... Lesser are they, Muslims who stay here. That's the first bit of the sentence. So, bearing in mind we're talking to children who haven't left the country yet, they're probably thinking in the head, but I don't want to go abroad. I don't want to see these other countries. They're full of infidels. They're full of evil. They're sinful countries with unrighteous laws. And they are uh, under Satan's control. Only the Muslim countries are under Allah's control. Like, I want to stay here with Allah. I love Allah. That's what they'll be thinking. But Allah is saying, no, don't think that. You'll be lesser if you think that. I will love you less, says Allah. I will think badly of you, children, says Allah, if you, st if you stay here and you want to just be nice and peaceful in your own country. So don't do that. If you refuse to find your way to the jihad, unless you are coming back and you're badly injured, I will not love you. So what you have to do if you want my love, says Allah to his children... You must go to perform the jihad using your wealth and lives in the causes of Allah. So even though 10 minutes ago he was saying, Oh, children, I love you. I'm going to be nice to you. I'm going to give you guardians. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to treat you nicely and give you wisdom. Now we're past the bit where we got the kids' attention. We're straight into the bit about, no, none of that counts anymore. Now you're going to be lesser unless you go to other countries and suffer and die for the causes of Allah's jihad. That's what this means. And then he goes on to say, Allah favours you when you do. So you'll be back in his good books, O oh children, once you've gone to the other country and you've um, met the other jihadis and you start killing the infidels. But only if you perform the jihad without hesitation. Now, why would Allah, in his great mercy and wisdom, prevent hesitation? Think about it. If you're a child, say you're, gonna, say you're on your BMX, right, and you're coming up to a big jump, if you hesitate at the last minute, why are you hesitating? It's because you don't think you're going to make the jump and it's going to result in you being harmed. That's the reason for the hesitation. The hesitation is doubt leading to self-preservation. So we know hesitation in a child is not an evil. A, a, a hesitant child, a fearful child, is for his own safety. But no, we're not allowed to hesitate. We're not allowed to have any fears. We're not allowed to have any doubts or questions. Go and kill the Jews and Christians, O oh children. Otherwise, Allah won't love you. That's why he's using that. Perform the jihad. Do not hesitate. Allah promises you goods and a greater wage in the afterlife, plus all your virgins, if you go and do the jihad. Don't hesitate. Don't argue. Don't think badly of the people that you're going to kill. Just kill them. They don't have souls. But if you don't, I won't love you. You will have bad luck. Your own village will hate you. Your parents won't be um, making money to be able to feed you. They'll be hated as well. And it'll all be your fault, child. You'll be the only one. That's what he's saying here. He's picking out the child and saying, you can be part of something greater if you just go and murder the rest of the world. But you'll be on your own in sadness and you'll be hated by all, including Allah, if you don't. That's why he's saying that. So don't hesitate because you'll think if you hesitate. And we can't have that. Then he goes on to say he's going to judge you by many degrees. So even though at first it was equal, it was a one nation of Muslims, then it was men, women, children, animals. Then it was higher men, lesser men, higher children, lesser children, higher women, lesser women, higher animals, lower animals. Now it's subdivided again. So there's actually like 16 different groups because each group's divided into four. You've got the ones at the top who are sinless, the ones next down who are slightly sinful but got forgiven, then you've got the third ones which are just like obedient Muslims that didn't do the jihad, then you've got the ones who are like infidels. And there's four times four of that, so there's 16 groups all together, Mohammed being the top group, and us Westerners being the infidel bottom group. So it's not very equal, is it? So when we look back in the past of Allah's many promises, we can tell none of those promises hold any water because of what he's saying here. And he's teaching this to children. So let me remind you, O Westerners and apologists of Islam, while you're reading this one, 
the poorly translated, heavily romanticised English Quran written by Satan, in the words of Allah, by the way, Allah said that, not me. When you're quoting this one and you're saying, Daily, you've misquoted, you've mistranslated, this is the real one. No, this is written by Satan. Allah says that himself. And the reason we know it's written by Satan, because it's actually more kindly. It doesn't demand so much the death of everyone, only some people. It doesn't demand that you beat and starve your women and then rape them, only some of them. And it certainly doesn't demand that you send all your children directly to jihad, don't pass go, don't collect $200, only some of them. So we know from this that Satan and Allah, although they're very similar, Allah is actually worse. Satan is like semi-Allah. That's what that means. And then he finishes off by saying, if you don't do this, and you whinge about it, his angels will say, we were weakened by your deceit, O, cho o uh, Muslim children. So the angels who are the guardians and protectors of the whole Islamic nation are weakened by children's faithlessness. That's what we're telling little Jimmy Mohammed here. We're saying, Jimmy Mohammed, the fact that you are not obedient and the fact that you don't surrender to Islam, the fact you've got questions and you don't want to go and do this jihad, that you want to stay here with your mom and just be, you know, a peaceful guy, that is directly weakening the angels. And the angels and Allah are the ones who are going to bring the paradise. So you are dishonoring everybody when you do that. So don't hesitate. Grab a gun. Off you go. And then he finishes up by saying, if you don't, and I quote, you will find an evil torment, a place in Allah's everfire wherein you will abide forever and will suffer greatly. That's the end of the verse. So we know Allah is using a carrot of 72 virgins, wealth and uh, togetherness, brotherhood and your family doing really well and Allah loving you. And also the stick of you'll be damned forever, you'll get no virgins, your family will be hated, you'll be hated and you'll burn forever if you don't go and Allah won't love you. This is pure emotional and economic manipulation in the service of Allah's jihad. So we know children are not children in Islam. Children are just swords with automatic bodies attached to them to go and kill the Jews and Christians. And it's absolutely disgusting. So if that upsets you in any way or you feel like this is unjust to those children, the first thing to do is accept this as truth. Because as I said, and I hope you do this, you will not know this truth if you stick to Quran.com or these badly translated fictions, the false doctrine of Satan, in the words of Allah. Allah says that himself. I didn't make that up. Allah says that in his own word. And remember, Allah only speaks Arabic. When you get to his created paradise garden, when he finally creates it, Arabic's the only language there. Because only Arabs are going to get there, Arab Muslims. So don't quote this or think that this is true. This is a trickery to deceive us. This is the infidel version. The Quran of the infidels, which we should ignore. So back to the Quran of the Muslims. This is the one you want to fact check me by. And like I said at the beginning, when you do, you will 100% find every single word I'm saying to you now and have previously said is true of Allah, Muslims and Islam. And if you don't like that, you have to accept this truth then, having learnt the truth and the wisdom that this book unfortunately does contain, then we can get our heads together as decent moral people and we can make a counter plan to defeat Allah's holy jihad and put the world to right and bring true peace where we won't have to fight each other, when these little kids won't have to be brainwashed, sent to their deaths and die, which is what we can see happening where the jihads are committed. Name me a jihad that's successfully, you know, name me a, a victory that they've had through a jihad. You show me one victory that a jihad has generated for any Islamic country. You will not find one. You will not find one because there are littered fields of bodies of dead children, who they blame on the Jews, by the way, in defeat. That's what you'll get at the end of a jihad and what the Quran of the Muslims is actually proposing and providing for you, O oh Muslims. So, use your head, find the truth, accept it, plan, do the right thing. And then you'll have a much better life as a result. So, I hope you enjoyed that. That's the end of this video and the end of this reading. God bless you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Oh, I forgot the click. <laughs> and if you need any further details, go back and watch my previous videos in the series of Without Lies, Islam Dies. If you refuse, you're not worth shipping enough. So that's all for today. I'll be back tomorrow at 7.15. Until then, have a lovely evening. God bless you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.